Okay, let's get started. Um, so, I don't know if, if I had a mistake on the PDF or, or whatnot. I don't know. There was about like five students that emailed me uh, uh, yesterday and were asking me questions about problem 330. And I went, I was, I, I assigned 33. Did I have a mistake on the PDF or? Sometimes, um, I figured it out a while ago, but sometimes I round up to zero on accident, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so. All right. Now, my apology, if there was any uh, confusion on my part, my apologies. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was always supposed to be 3-3, three, three, so that's why I sent the email yesterday, and I said just, here's the problem, so, uh, so that can sort of explain. Um, I checked yesterday, homework 3.1 is graded, homework 3.2 is currently being graded. Uh, that solution will uh, post later uh, today, uh, and so we're going to keep uh, rocking and rolling. Um, I want to explain conceptually a little bit about what we're talking about today and why we're, uh, we're talking about them. Uh, no, this is not a, a, a student corrective device. This is a, a little bit of a prop for... Um, uh, for uh, uh, sort of explaining what's going on. So let's sort of uh, uh, go back to a little bit of what we talked about last time. And last time, so we had formally defined a moment uh, and we had uh, uh, spent uh, last uh, lecture talking about moments in 2D, okay? And moments in 2D are really sort of a special case mathematically of what we're talking about today. But what I mean by that is so when we're dealing with a moment in two dimensions, okay, we have a point, you know, some point here that we're interested in and some force F. And it doesn't matter where the, uh, the force is. It doesn't matter where the point is. And the idea is to determine the moment about that point, right? That's kind of the idea. Now, in terms of the direction, and this is what I mean by a special case, the direction of that moment or the axis about which that moment is rotating is the z-axis, right? This is two dimensions, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and so that moment is rotating about the z-axis, right? But instead of today, instead of talking about uh, what is the moment about the z-axis, today I want to ask what is the moment about any axis, okay? So the idea is, okay, Let's say this little ruler here uh, uh, represents a force out in space, and I want to know how much moment is being generated about this axis pointing at any random direction. Now, to give you a little bit of a taste as to why you might be interested in this and a taste of, of next semester, uh, for those of you that decide uh, to take Engineering 216 next semester, the current plan is I'll teach that uh, as well, um, but if we have a moment in space, okay, or we, sorry, if we have a force in space and we have a point of interest, we do the cross product R cross F, and that will give us the moment vector in 3D about that point in question. But if we're talking about a force applied in space and we're interested in a given axis, like let's say we have this beam in a building or we have this uh, shaft in a machine that we're designing, that moment is going to have various uh, components acting on the shaft. And what we might be interested in is the moment along the axis. Because what that means is the moment along the axis of this element is the moment that's causing this element to twist. Okay? So what we might be doing here is we might be performing this mathematical computation to determine the twisting moment about this axis. For you mechanical engineers, uh, that's looking at determining the torsion uh, in the element. Because... Any time we have an element in a, a, a system that's being twisted, we have to assess the, uh, the torsional stress uh, that's in the system. We'll talk about all that uh, next semester. So the, ele the, the component of the moment that's acting along the axis is the, uh, uh, the component that's causing it to twist. The moments that's not acting uh, along the axis is what's causing it to bend. So the idea is to, for, to give you sort of a taste of what we're talking about in regards to next semester. The idea is if you have a moment in space in, in 3D, some of that moment's going to cause your element to bend, some of it's going to cause it to twist. So I, I want you to, to kind of have an understanding of why we're doing what we're doing. Now, in order to do that, in order to assess this concept, we're going to have to uh, introduce 
a new way to multiply vectors. Up until now, we've been dealing with this. This is the cross product, okay? So let's talk about the cross product. And there's something that I haven't really emphasized a lot because we haven't needed it, but I'm going to sort of talk about this a little today. Um, so let's go back to the definition of the cross product. We have a vector A and a vector B, and we multiply them to get another vector, okay? So what's the deal with that other vector? Okay, well, in order to define a vector, you need a magnitude and a direction. The direction of this vector is normal to the plane formed by A and B. But the magnitude, the magnitude of this vector is equal to the area of this par parallelogram. Now, how do you compute the area of this parallelogram? If you know the length of A and you know the length of B and you know this angle, the area of this parallelogram is the length of A times the length of B times the sine of theta. So one of the things that the cross product can do, and again, we haven't really worried about this because it hasn't really mattered for what we've been doing in statics, but you can use the cross product to determine the angle between two vectors, right? If you have the uh, cross, if you have vector A and vector B, take the cross product of them. So now you got three vectors: vector A, vector B, and their cross product. Get all their magnitudes, and the magnitude of the cross product equals the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of theta. You can solve, and boom, you got the angle between the two vectors. Now the problem is that's kind of bulky, so there might be a little bit of a better way of doing it, um, and that's where the dot products are going to come into play. But I just wanted to illustrate the the presence of the sine of theta. Okay because you're going to see for dot products how we see the cosine of theta. Um, as for computing it, I'll, I'll just very lightly touch on that. You know that there's multiple ways, rule of Serres, cofactor expansion, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> and the formal definition of a moment, remember, a moment is a vector, um, and the formal definition of that moment is R cross F. Now let's just make sure we're clear about the position vector. R starts at the point about which moments are taken, and it ends at any point along the line of action of F. And we're going to slightly tweak that definition a little bit today for moments about an axis, but, uh, but you'll, I think you'll be able to follow along. Okay. Everybody good so far? Now let's talk about dot products. Now I'm curious, how many of you have had a mathematics course where you've done cross products and dot products already? All right, which one's easier? Dot products are a lot easier. So if you haven't had a course being exposed to a, uh, dot products. Um, rest assured that this little derivation I'm going to show you is going to end in a formula that is ridiculously easy to employ. But hopefully if you weren't clear about this before, today you'll understand why that formula works. Okay? So let's talk about the dot product. All right? um, why does that matter? Well, let's go back to this uh, expression for moments in 2D. Remember, when you are determining moments, okay, a moment is a cross product. It is a cross product of a position vector and a force vector. So whenever you do a cross product, you end up with another vector. Even in two dimensions, right? When we do a cross product of a, an R vector and an F vector in 2D, we get another vector. It just so happens that this vector only has one component in the Z direction. It's a polyjunct times K, which is why in two dimensions, that's ultimately only really what mattered was the scalar magnitude. Even though when we cross the, pro, uh, the two vectors, we get another vector, it's only the one uh, uh, component that matters. So for moments about arbitrary axes, what we're ultimately going to do is we're going to take the cross product of, a, uh, of R cross F, and we are going to dot it with a unit vector along the axis in question. <clears throat> and so the dot product is going to yield a scalar. If you remember, I said that uh, there's two ways of multiplying vectors. One way yields another vector, and we, it, you know, the vector product, and we called it a cross product because that's the, you know, the symbol that we use. But another way of multiplying vectors is to take vector A times vector B, and we get a number, a scalar. And so the scalar product, we call that the dot product, A dot B. So let's consider two vectors, P and Q, okay? so. P and Q, P, you know, magnitude of P, magnitude of Q. So now let's define a dot product. And so the easiest way to define the dot product is to define what our goals are. Now with cross products, we had to worry about the magnitude and the direction, right? We had to define a vector product such that the magnitude and direction were, were clearly defined. Well, because we're looking at a scalar product, all we need to worry about is defining a dot product such that we want the scalar to be some value. So what do we want the scalar to be? 
Well, I propose that if the Krauss product yielded a magnitude of AB sine theta, let's define the dot product so that it's the magnitude of AB cosine theta, or I, I guess P and Q. So we're going to define the dot product such that P dot Q represents a result in a scalar quantity, which is equal to the magnitude of each vector times the cosine of the angle between them. Now, let's break out some uh, pop quiz on trig and geometry. What is the cosine of zero degrees? One. One. What is the cosine of 90 degrees? Zero. zero. Okay. That's really important to keep in the back of your head. So why is that important? If you remember in that pre-recorded lecture that I did where we talked about cross products, we derived a formula for the cross product. And the way that we did that is we said we want to derive a formula for any vector. Well, we know that any vector can be expressed as a pile of junk times I plus a pile of junk times J plus a pile of junk times K. So we said, let's look at the dot or the cross products associated with I, J, and K. Well, I'm going to do the same thing here. In order to define a formula for the dot product, let's look at the dot products involving I, J, and K. Now, you just said the, uh, 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 the cosine of 90 degrees is 0 and the cosine of 0 degrees is 1. So let's think about what that means. Let's take one of these vectors and dot it with itself. So let's take I dot I. The magnitude of I is 1, right? So if I go back to my definition, I want the magnitude or the, the, the value of the dot product to be the magnitude of the two vectors times the cosine of the angle between them. What is the angle formed between I and I? It's 0, right? So if I take the magnitude of I, 1, times the magnitude of I, 1, times the cosine of 0, 1, what's 1 times 1 times 1? 1, right? So what you can see is that whenever you're looking at dot products involving I, J, K, whenever you dot one of these vectors with itself, you get 1. What about dotting the vectors with something else? What if I do I dot J? What's the angle formed between I and J? 90 degrees, right? And what's the cosine of 90 degrees, as you said? Zero. So whenever you dot a vector, one of these vectors with themselves, you get one. But whenever you dot a vector with one of the other ones, like I dot J or I dot K or K dot J, whenever it's with an, an opposing term, the angle formed between them is always 90 degrees, so the dot product is zero. Okay? Does that make sense? So if that makes sense, what you've got is uh, you've, you've got the, uh, 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 a pretty simple relationship that you can use to expand upon. The other nice thing about the dot product is that it's commutative because the result is a scalar. So this was not true with cross products. Like A cross B is not the same thing as B cross A, but that is true for dot products. A dot B is the same thing as B dot A. So that makes life a little easier. Everybody with me so far? So, if you remember, I did something like this on the pre-recorded video. I know it's a little bit of a mess, so I'll walk you through it. So, if we dot, you know, two random vectors, P and Q, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, polynomial multiplication, right? So, if you've got, you know, A plus B plus C times D plus E plus F, you're doing F times this, F times this, F times this, and then E times this, E times this, E times this, right? You know how that works when you're doing uh, multiplication, a lot like when you learned how to do it you know, in third or fourth grade. So what I've got here in this term is I'm saying, okay, let's do P dotted Q. And so I'm saying, okay, let's do this times this, this times this, this times this, this times this. I'm doing each of the permutations of all these uh, uh, terms. I get uh, this big old sum of nine terms. And I know it looks like a lot of alphabet soup, but it gets a whole lot easier when I look at my dot products. Anytime I have a vector dotted with itself, it's 1. Anytime I have a vector dotted with an opposing term, it's 0. So the only thing I'm left with is this. For those of you that have had uh, uh, or seen this before, isn't that how you do a dot product, right? If you ever got a dot b, you take all the coefficients and multiply the corresponding terms and add them together. It's that simple. Dot products are super easy. So a lot easier than the cross product. No rule of Saris or cofactor expansion or anything like that that you got to remember. You can just plug and chug and do it. So far so good? Okay. Now, 
where does the dot product come into play? Like, where is it useful? Number one, it's a lot more, uh, a lot more um, computationally efficient. If you've got two vectors and you want to determine the angle between the two vectors, it's a lot easier. Remember, the cross product said that P cross Q is equal to the magnitude of P times the magnitude of Q times the sine of the angle. And the dot product is the same thing, it's just the cosine. The difference is that the cross product is a lot harder to do than the uh, dot product. So you can do this a lot faster. So if for some reason I gave you a, a question on a test set, find the angle between two vectors, I would not use the cross product. It would take too long. Just use the dot product. It's a lot easier. Um, the other thing about, uh, uh, the other useful um, uh, uh, value of, or the other useful application of a dot product is to use the volume of a parallel a pipette. Man, you never get to say that uh, uh, word in a sentence very often. But basically, if you've got three vectors, P, Q, and S, the cross product of P and Q will give you the area of this parallelogram, and if you dot it with S, that'll give you the volume of that region. We aren't going to do that in here, but that's uh, just a mathematical, you know, term here. But this one's kind of kind of important: the projection of a vector on an axis. And what that is is basically it's sort of a fancy way of saying is if I have, let's go to, to the statics example, because that's obviously what we care about in here. So if I have some axis out in space, right, and let's say here's a point on that axis, right, so here's force, here's the point, R cross F will tell me the moment about this point. But what I can do is I can take that vector, multiply it by lambda, do a dot product with lambda, lambda being a unit vector defining the direction of this axis, and basically what it'll do is, in a nutshell, tell me how much of that vector is projected onto this axis. Or if I've got some moment out in space and I want to determine how much moment is acting about this axis, just take the moment vector, dot it with the unit vector for this. So that's basically what we're going to do here. So if you want to compute moments about an arbitrary axis, what you do is you got R cross F, which is your moment vector, dot it with lambda, lambda being the unit vector along whatever axis you're interested in. So this is how you would determine the moments about an arbitrary axis. Now there's a couple things to keep in mind. Um, R starts at the point about which moments are taken and R ends uh, at any, la action or any, la any point along the line of action of F. But because we're taking moments about an axis, we actually have a few different options about how we want to define R. We'll get into that in our example here in a bit. Um, one of the other things that's worth mentioning is if you want to kind of do a little bit of a shortcut, um, uh, you can do this. So just so you're aware, uh, whenever you're using this definition, the idea is that you use your cross product first and then dot that result with lambda. But if you want to do it all at once, you can actually do a three by three determinant. And instead of putting i, j, k up here, you just put your three terms for your unit vector right there. You don't have to do that, but that's a, a little bit of a shortcut. Don't worry, we got an example here we're going to do here in a second that's going to illustrate a lot of this. I'm not going to leave you in the dark. And, and, and by the way, before we uh, uh, broach into this, I'll say that in terms of more uh, the, what I'll call, out there topics, this is probably what I would say not only one of the more out there topics in this course, but this is probably the last out there topic in this course. After that, it gets, uh, after this, it gets much more grounded and much more reality. Uh, base. Not to say this isn't important, but again, we engineers try and keep it simple whenever possible. Any questions? All right, so here's the problem we're going to do, and I'm going to go ahead and pull up my notebook because I already have this right here, uh, but there's a lot going on here, so let me pull up my notebook and we'll, we'll take a sec and, uh, and digest what's going on with this problem. No, I don't want my ink annotations. Let me make this a little bigger. Okay, so here's the problem that we're doing. I have a, uh, a frame that is uh, supported here. So here's this frame, ACD, and it's supported by these cables. And I got this little um, uh, load here, P, uh, being applied to, uh, to point C. The idea is to determine the tension in the cable, so or hold on. So we know the tension in the cable is 450 newtons. So the idea is that we got this load here. 
The frame is being supported by this cable. We know the tension in the cable is 450 newtons. So what I want to determine is the moment about this axis here, okay? And it's the moment generated by this force, okay? So going back to what I said earlier, okay? So the idea is here's our axis. So think of AD as the axis. In this point B, there's a force going like this. I want to know how much of that moment is going about this axis. So I know a, a, a lot going on here and a lot to digest, but we'll, uh, we'll take our time with it. Don't worry. It seems scary. It's actually a lot easier than you would think. <clears throat> I'll give you a sec to do some writing, and then we'll, we'll get to do some... Some plugging and chugging. <coughs> that out of the way. Right. Everybody good? I can wait if you need me to. All right. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do, I was kind of lazy here because I, I copy and pasted this image. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write some point coordinates, okay? Um, so, okay, because I'm going to use these point coordinates quite a bit uh, throughout this example, and I just want you to, uh, uh, to follow along with me. So, what we're going to do is we're going to record the coordinates of a few different points, mainly four of them. We're going to record the coordinates of A and D, and we're doing A and D because that's the axis about which we are uh, summing moments. Um, and we're going to record the coordinates of B and H, okay? Because the idea is, again, this is, so what I need is I need a unit vector along this axis, so this is, uh, this is a lambda that I need, and I need a force vector like this. That's ultimately what I'm trying to do, is I'm trying to define lambda and f. R is actually a lot easier than you would think. If you've got lambda and f, R is kind of a piece of cake. So what I need is the coordinates of point A, point B, point D, and point H. And I know that uh, like many of our problems, once we get the coordinates figured out, a lot of the rest of it becomes pretty plug and chug. So let's make sure we do this together. Now let's look here at our schematic. Here's the origin. This is the x-axis. This is the y-axis. This is the z-axis. All of our coordinates are in meters, so maybe I should write this here, um, in meters. What are the coordinates of point A? Let's see if we're paying attention. What are the coordinates of this point right here? Somebody help me out. Anybody. There we go. There we go. Zero, zero, zero point seven five. Does everybody see that? Is that okay? All right. Let me scroll this down a little bit so I'm not writing on the bottom of this screen here. All right. Zero, zero point seven five. Okay. What about um, what about B? Somebody else help me out. What are the coordinates of B? There we go. Yes, yeah, 0 0.5. Okay, there we go. Is that okay? Is everybody all right with this? All right, I'll do the next one. D is easy. That's 1, 0, 0. All right, what about H? Somebody help me out with H. This one's probably a little tricky. What about the x-axis? What's the term on the x-axis? 0.875, what about the y-axis? 0.75, yeah, we're, we're looking at this one right here. Yeah, so 0 
0 0.750. I'm sorry, if that's if that was small, if I needed to blow that up, let me know. And if there's if you know why, why I will be personally injured if anybody can't read my handwriting, let me know. That was a joke, not a, not a very funny one. Is everybody okay with this this part? That's a great question. Why don't we have C? Because uh, the, the, the reason is because we really don't need it for this problem. Uh, we can define the coordinates of C if we would like, uh, but we, we don't need it. This problem is trying to determine the moment about axis AD. So obviously we need the moments um, uh, generated, or we need the coordinates of points A and point D. Uh, and what we're trying to determine is the moments along that axis generated by basically force BH, okay? If we were trying to determine the moments about this axis generated by this force right here, you are 100% correct that we probably would need the coordinates of C. However, one other thing I would add, while we would probably need the coordinates of C for like position vectors and whatnot, we probably don't need any coordinates to write a description of that force vector because this force vector is just going to be the magnitude times j pointing downward, or negative pj. Does that make sense? Everybody else okay with that? These are great questions, so please, you know, uh, if you got them, you know, let them fly. Everybody good? All right. Now, <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to handle this one component at a time. So our formula, sorry, oh, that's not a vector, is lambda dotted with R cross F. So the idea is I'm going to try and, com and, and write each of those vectors one at a time. Okay, and I'm going to start with lambda. Okay, so let's see what we can do about lambda. All right, so lambda is our unit vector. And it is along axis AD. Because the problem stated, we want to know the, uh, the, the moment about axis AD. So if I want to determine the vector along axis AD, what I can do is take the coordinates of D, subtract them from the coordinates of A, and I get 1, 0, negative 0 0.75, and therefore vector AD is 1i plus 0j plus negative 0.75k. And if you don't like using the, um, the coordinates, you can sort of just look at it. Going from point A to D, I am going along the positive x-axis, 1. I'm not changing vertically and I'm going along the z-axis backwards this distance right here. So you can either use the coordinates or you can use the method here. Does that make sense? Now, now that I've got the uh, uh, position vector, which by the way, in meters, okay, now I need the magnitude. Why do I need the magnitude of AD? Why do I need that? Well, in order to determine a unit vector, how do you determine a unit vector? What is the general formula? You take a vector and you divide it by its own magnitude, right? Make sense? So, how do we determine the magnitude of a vector? Pythagorean theorem. So, what do we got? All right, what is that? 1.25, do I have a second on that? 
And that's 1.25 meters. Okay? Um, if it's okay, I'm going to scroll down once I can find my mouse. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. So therefore, lambda AD is AD divided by its own magnitude, which is what? We have 1 meter over 1.25 meters times I plus, we know that's going to be 0, plus negative 0 0.75. 1.25. Sorry, that's K. Why did I write J? So what's 1 over 1.25? 0 0.8 plus 0J plus negative, and what is that? 0 0.6. All right, and I'm going to circle that in red. All right, does that make sense? I'm hoping that at this point, things like vector definitions, like if I say define a unit vector, that's pretty easy, right? We take the vector, divide it by its own magnitude. Everybody with me so far? So if you're okay with that, I'm going to do the force vector now uh, because I want to save the position vector for last. So let's do the force vector. And that's a long uh, cable BH for this problem. So if you scroll up or go back to the problem definition, you'll see that we're, turn we're determining the moment about this axis, and we're determining the moment that is caused by the force along line BH, along this cable. So let's go back to how we define force vectors in 3D. So how do we define a force vector in 3D? We take the magnitude and multiply it by a unit vector. So we got to do, uh, so some of these calculations are going to be a little repetitive. So I might go through this a little quickly. So how did we do this before? We took the coordinates of D minus the coordinates of A. So how about the coordinates of H minus the coordinates of B? So the coordinates of H are 0 0.875, 0 0.75, 0, and the coordinates of B, 0 0.5. 0, 0 0.75. I need to do a subtraction. So, 0 0.875 minus a half, that's 0 0.375. 0 0.75 minus 0 oh, is 0 0.75, and that's going to be negative 0 0.75. So therefore, BH is and again, in meters. All right. Am I going too fast or are we okay with this? Don't hesitate if you got a question. All right. Next, we need a unit vector. So we need the magnitude. What is the magnitude of this vector? I'm going to make sure that you all are awake and helping me out.
1.125 meters. Do I have a second on that? All right. So therefore, lambda BH is, and that's actually going to get kind of cramped, so I'm going to move that down a little bit. Can I scroll a little bit? So therefore, lambda BH is BH over its own magnitude, which is What'd you get? I got 1.26565. Did you square root? I think that might, yeah. All right, so let's see what we get here. What do we get for this? A third. And so what are we going to get for these? Two thirds. So really what this vector is, is a third I plus two-thirds J uh, plus negative two-thirds K. Did I interrupt somebody? I thought I heard somebody have a question. And now, remind me, what are the units? Here. No. They're unitless. This is a unit vector. Right? We took a vector and divided it by its own magnitude. Whenever you do that, lambda should be unitless. Now, why did we do that here if we're interested in a force vector? Because recall, a force vector is the magnitude times the direction. So can somebody remind me from the problem description, what is the, what's the magnitude for this vector, for this force? 450 newtons. So TBH is 450 newtons. Therefore, our force vector, which is really the tension in that cable, is that force times that unit vector. So that's It's really that. So, I think I can do that one in my head. 450 times a third is 150, and the rest are 300. And again, so that we're clear, I'm going to ask you about the units. What are the units for this vector? Newtons. So that's our force vector, right? Let's go back to the point of the problem. Lambda dotted with R cross F. I'm calling it T sub BH, but that's our force vector. This is our F vector, if you want to think of it like this. This is F, and that is lambda, right? So we've got lambda and F. All we need is R. Let me scroll back up to where you can see that. So we need our position vector. R. 
R, R, little r. All right, <clears throat> before I get into the position vector, because I think that's kind of the most interesting part, does anybody have any questions on what I'm doing so far? What I'm hoping is that by now, the stuff that we're doing now is pretty rote. It's pretty, like, we're just going through the motions. If we're going through the motions and this part is actually boring you, then I've done my job because you understand it. So, everybody good? Okay. Now, when we're summing moments about a point, the position vector starts at that point and it ends along the line of action of F. Because we're taking moments about an, ax, uh, about an axis instead of a point, we can tweak this a little bit. R starts anywhere along the axis in question. Which in this case is lambda AD. And R ends anywhere along the line of action of the force, which in this case is TBH. So I'm going to give you a second to write that down, and then I want to show you a couple things. Everybody got that? So here's what's kind of wild about this. Because we're taking moments about an axis, we just need a vector that starts along that axis and ends anywhere along the line of action of force. So because I've got two points uh, for the axis in question, A and D, and I've got two points along the line of action of force, B and H, I could really pick any permutation that starts uh, at lambda and ends at the force, and I will get the same answer. Just like when we first started defining moments, I said there's two different options for the position vector, and you'll get the same answer at the end of the day. The same thing works here. So let's just try one, okay? Let's try... R defined from, let's say, D to H. So, in other words, I'm starting at D and I'm going to H. Does that meet the definition that I've described for the position vector? Yes. It starts anywhere along the axis in question, lambda AD. So, it's starting at D and it's going to H. The force line of action goes from B to H. So this works too. I could go from D to H. I could go from D to B. I could go from A to H or A to B. I'm just picking one. It doesn't matter. I'll show you what happens here in a minute. So H is defined 0.875 0, D is 1, 0, 0. You have that written earlier. Subtract those, and we get negative 0 0.125, 0 0.75, 0. So I propose, let's try R is this. Now, whenever you're writing position vectors, no lambdas, no none of that, because we need the actual distance. So this is n meters. And so, in order to determine that moment, along that line of action, we're going to use the definition that we've defined. Lambda dotted 
with R cross F. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that little shortcut I mentioned earlier that what we can do is instead of writing like I, J, K on the top row, instead of doing that, here's what I'm going to do. So what was lambda? It was 0 0.8, 0, negative 0 0.6. R, negative 0 0.125, 0 0.75, 0. And then F, 150, 300, negative 300. All right? And in order to evaluate this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the cofactor expansion pattern, and I'm just going to do it the same way, right? So what do we do? We take the term on the first row, 0 0.8, cross out the row and column, take the second term, cross out the row and column, then take the third term, cross out the row and column. And then plus, minus, plus. So instead of I, J, and K, it's just my lambda terms. It's no different, OK? And think, if you think about this, that kind of follows along the, dot, the definition of the dot product. Because whatever this stuff is, this stuff is, and this stuff is, you would just multiply like terms on the dot product. So again, it's kind of a shortcut. Now I'm curious who's the fastest in here. Who thinks they can get an answer for this? Which, by the way, if you all have probably like a graphing calculator, what you can do, if you want a shortcut, you can define this as a 3 by 3 matrix and just take the determinant of it, and it'll do it for you. I will give you a hint. Your answer is negative. Whatever you get here, it should be negative. <coughs> What's that? Negative 75. I'm getting something a little different. I got negative 90. Anybody? Okay, all right. Negative 90. Now, a couple questions. Before we're paying attention, do you may remember what the units are for this moment? It's a moment. So it should be, well, not per meter, times meters. Yeah, Newton meters. So therefore, MAD is negative 90 Newton meters or 90 Newton meters clockwise about that axis. Because remember, positive moments are clockwise, or sorry, positive moments are counterclockwise about that axis. All right. I got one final thing I want to show you, and then we're going to call it, okay? Because I know we're getting short on time. If you remember, I said that the position vector has to start along the axis in question and end along the line of action of the force. And I just said, try R defined for D to H. A note, other R vectors work. And if you don't believe me, try this. Try from A to B. If you do the vector from A to B, 
you only get 0.5i. And so I challenge you to go into this original expression here, the lambda dot r cross f, and instead of the r vector that I use, just try that. And you'll get the same answer, okay? You ought to try it, okay? I will have a homework uh, up on Blackboard soon that follows along with this, and I will double check the problem to make sure it's right. <laughs> That's all I've got, everybody. I will see you all on Friday. Friday, we talk about couples, force couples.